And welcome back to ABLF. I'm absolutely delighted now to welcome our next guest. She is the chairwoman and the CEO of Landmark Group. And for the last 25 years, she has guided and shaped the group's corporate strategy and really grown this very successful and well-known fashion and hospitality business in the Middle East, in Africa, and the Indian subcontinent. Now, in addition, of course, to her strategic and leadership focus, she currently oversees all of the retail hospitality operations, and also she drives the Landmarks Group CSR initiative. So I'm absolutely delighted on behalf of ABLF to welcome the chairwoman and CEO of Landmark Group, Renuka Jaktiani. Great to have you here. Thank you, Etta. So good to be here. Well, we're delighted to have you here and really to listen to some of your journey and indeed to listen to your great insight into what's happening in the retail sector. And when we look at, you know, the work that you have done and building this company, the largest retail and hospitality organization, one of them really in the Middle East, Africa, India, you know, you look around and there's definitely strength coming back to global economies. Um, talk to us a little bit about how things have been at Landmark. I think... On the whole, you know, the, when the year started, we were not sure, but we've just ended our financial year. And I must say that we've ended it, we've held well, we've held well to a lot of things in some parts of the business have actually grown through this. And there are, there've been positives, there've been downsides, but on the whole, it's been, it's been for us a year of learning and a great year. When we look back, we really look at this as a year which defines us in so many ways. So it is it is a good year. It's been tougher in some markets. India's Indeed, been yes. tough, you know. But as you say, I mean, huge learning for everybody. And in that learning, I think comes brings great ideas. But this also demands, you know, a lot of strong leadership, I think, without a doubt. And this is something that we're seeing, particularly when we're called on by leaders of industry here. How would you describe, I suppose, your own leadership style? And how have you adjusted, you know, in terms of what the pandemic has brought? So I'm a very hands-on leader. I'm kind of detail-oriented. I do micro, macro, and I, I think I'm a person who focuses on the current while I always keep a big picture in mind. So I don't just look at current, I don't think I could in my role, it would be disastrous, but um, I, I don't think you can get away from the current ever, you know? So I believe that, and I think if you had to say, what's my personal style, I'm one who pushes the bar. So I'll constantly look to say, how can I compete with myself? How can I improve my performance? To me, it's not about competing with the outside. It's about improving where I come from and always saying, what could I do differently? It's not just about better. It's about actually how, how one is moving and keeping abreast, keeping understanding how the market's moving. And that makes a big difference, you know? And of course, I'm to, go ahead. Sorry. I really believe that that is what is a key part of it. There's, you know, when you look at the pandemic, I also believe that leaders don't have a particular style anymore. You've got to adapt your style to the markets to be a real leader in today's market. And, but you've got to hold on to your core belief. And, and that is really what defines it. So when I, when I look at the pandemic, I wouldn't say I've had a leadership style which has been through the pandemic the same way. I don't think it would have worked. Because when the pandemic first came in, it was all about how do you look at inventory? How do you look at costs? How do you look at cash flows? So at that time, it was very directive in style to say, we need to do this, let's get on with this. And, you know, and, and really doing everything to protect the business from that perspective. As things moved on and as markets opened up, it needed to change. And I think it changed for every leader within our business. And some leaders managed to handle it better than others. Some knew how to keep that balance of taking risk, but actually keeping quite a bit of the control still in. Others found it more difficult. And I think it's that, it's that 
ability to adapt to that change, to that environment, which is, I don't think, you know, I, I think there actually we didn't do well enough in the way that we didn't, we didn't do it by leader. You know, we, you, you really had to say who's getting it right and wrong and how do we work? And I think we could have done that a bit differently. But as I close the year, I'm really proud of my team. I feel that they have been amazing. They've been determined, they've been resilient, and the results we have are really full credit to the team to say, the leaders, their teams to say, you know, whatever we've achieved is really thanks to our people. That's you know, great so to hear. It has been a year, it's been a disruptive year. Yes. It's been a year where we've had leadership movements, some good, some you know, which we would have liked not to have. That's always the case. But I think it's really a time where everyone's come together. Now talk and to me a little bit about, um, it sounds like a very inclusive approach is what you really, you know, brought on board. You, you lead, I, I, tell me a little bit about that. So to me, Inclusive is really about including every kind of aspect into the business. To me, inclusive is not just about your mix of different nationalities, different uh, genders. And I mean, if you look at our workforce and we have a workforce of about 40,000 people today, we would be, so we'd operate about, you know, across 11 countries, over 50, 60 nationalities, 35% of our workforce roughly is women today, you know, and we employ a lot of Saudi women today, which is, uh, which is quite, you know, it started off with nothing, but we would have close to 5,000 Saudi women today on our team, you know, and that's, that's only happened over the last few years, you know, 10 years back, we won't have had a single woman from Saudi on our team. So, a lot is changing, but to me, if I really look at it, inclusion is about how you get people who are different, different in their experiences, different in their skill sets, different age groups, and who therefore know how to, you know, how to leverage each other's strengths, challenge each other, so it's it's really that mix to me, which is inclusivity, including different skills, including different ways of thinking. My best learning in a lot of ways and my biggest challenges have come from having three children in the business, all different to each other, all kind of, you know, very, very different, all with their strong opinions. But it's taught me to think different. And I'm grateful for that, you know. And it's not only about them, but it is about the other younger people in the business who, who don't let you stay where you are and thank God for it, you know. So it is different every day. Yes, and indeed you have to look to the fact that, you know, there will be a legacy there and they will be the leaders of the future. So it's about, yeah. you know, rolling with it, I suppose. When you look on a wider scale, you know, outside your your own industry, so to speak, and look at, you know, I suppose leadership lessons that, uh, you know, the pandemic might have taught the world. Is there anything particular that you think about that maybe we've all had to stand back and learn? If I had, I think for me, that would be the first thing was never take anything for granted. I, I mean, the, the aspect of taking anything as business as usual, taking it for granted, I think the pandemic has taught us that that'll never work. To, to the second one, to me, the biggest one was to actually look at how decision making needs to be agile. And how that, I think we live in a world where we have to work with speed, we have to work with agility in every way, not just of decision making, but with implementation, you know. And 
Finally, it is never about one person. It is about building a strong team, a diverse team, and empowering them to take those decisions to move at a certain speed. And above all, I think inaction is not an option. You know, you have to, you have to take a call, you have to move, you can't wait around and say, you know, I'll take my time over it. That luxury doesn't exist anymore. You know, so you have to, it's, it's not easy for me to do that, in fact, and I'm getting better at it, but I, I like to take my time on decisions, but that's changing. Indeed it is, and I, I suppose it's changing definitely when we look at it in, you know, the retail sector and in hospitality and that agility that's needed in business. And I think we hear this from everybody, you know, talk to us specifically, you know, about the impact on retail and hospitality, but how have you seen retail shift in the last two years or in I the last five years, maybe? I think if you really look at retail, it's moving completely. I think um, the first thing which has really moved is really the customer, you know, and the customer is completely different today. The customer is demanding. The customer knows what they want. They understand value in a different way. They understand what they, um, they understand which brands they want to shop at. They understand what they want to pay. But, and I think for a retailer, that's brought about different challenges. I think, you know, it's, to me, um, the customer is moving faster than the retailer. And that's the one thing the retailer has to constantly see that they adapt to. But that I think is, um, we've looked at that in many different ways. And one of the ways we looked at it is to say, what do we really stand for? And we, we took a call, this was going to be two, three things. It was one is we would always stand for value. We would stand for the customer in the way that we've built our own brands, our own businesses, and therefore adapting our products to the customer is a very strong core belief in our businesses. So it is about the customer, it is about value. And the third one we're realizing more and more is you have to be where the customer wants you to be. So whether it's online or offline, you have to be where the customer is. And in the pandemic, we fast-tracked our e-commerce. So before the pandemic, while we had started on e-commerce and we were geared up, we, we today have crossed over 10% in e-commerce in our businesses. We believe that this, is, this will only go higher and we have to gear ourselves up to say, what would it be in three years, in five years time? What is the infrastructure we need to do? What is, what is technology and how do we need to invest on technology to be able to build on that infrastructure? You know, so, and we completely believe in value. So a new business for us, and it's about three years old now is a discount grocery business. Uh, we call it Viva, and Viva is built on a private label grocery business, really, which is which is all about value. We don't we don't sell a single brand which is not ours. So no Coke, no Pepsi, no Lipton tea, you know. And it's brave. And I wondered whether you know it would work, but I think what works is value in that and so in those that's really where i see the customer change you mm -hmm. know so we believe we we are an omni-channel retailer we will always be an omni-channel retailer we don't think just e-commerce we don't think just stores anymore indeed so yeah. to be where the customer is 
where the customer is, and as you say, making sure that you deliver that value. I've had uh, yes. I've come over to your Viva store. It's very near here, so well done. It is, I think, Thank an you. exceptional store, and it's uh, it's always busy. So this is good too that you have a lot of interest in that, and I think people are welcome it in the region too. So well done on taking that uh, chance, as you said. But I think it's it's going to pay off very well. Now we have a few people. We've lots of people watching and listening, but we have our. Um, knowledge partner from the American University of Sharjah. And I know we have one of our university students standing by. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, our, our leaders of the future, we love to include them. And I know, I believe we have Anam Fatima with us. So if um, Anam is around, I'll bring her into the conversation. And there she is, lovely to see you. Anam, I'm gonna hand the floor over to you. Lovely to see have you join us. Good afternoon. My name is Anam Fatima. I'm pursuing a Bachelor's of Science in Finance with double minors in Data Science and Economics. Ms. Renika, no. I am extremely honored to be conversing with you. Speaking of which, as an accomplished businesswoman, what would you say are the most important traits that determine a leader's success? So, to me, it's not just about their innate ability, their experience, or the knowledge they have it's it's essentially for me two three things one is there has to be a passion for what they do they have to really feel passionate about what they do and they have to a sense of entrepreneurship as a leader but equally important and that we realize is is never enough so a leader today has to have an ability to actually execute that well so you can be a great strategic thinker, but if you can't actually translate your ideas into reality, it doesn't work. And the big one for me is realizing that nobody is a superstar or an island by themselves. So they've got to know how to pick their team, how to build the skill sets within their team. And so the execution and the passion have to go together for me today. What a lovely answer there. Thank you. Sorry, Anna. I was just going to thank Ms. Renika for her extremely constructive and insightful response. As an aspiring yep. leader myself, that is something I sure am going to hold on to. And on that note, thank you, Aviala, for having me over. All the best to you. Thank you. That's great. And she has a she's a great focus on her studies there, which will no doubt, I mean, serve her well. I mean, she's, she's really doing a lot at the moment. So. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Renuka, talk to me a little bit about when we look at travel restrictions. I mean, you have, you know, you've business in the Middle East, you know, in Africa and India. I mean, you've really been able to expand a lot and there's been great opportunities there. But how have travel restrictions, you know, impacted the industry? I mean, they have. I mean, haven't, I haven't physically seen our businesses for quite some time, right? It's it's just not been possible and every time you think of traveling something comes up and you can't travel so i haven't managed to travel for the pandemic period i mean literally it's been a day in bahrain and that's about it you know so and it's it's not just not seeing one's own business but it's actually not being able to to meet people to attend fairs to you know to kind of meet suppliers and it's it's difficult to to know what's happening in a market without being in a market you know to to us that's that's really important in the industry we are and that's unfortunate that we haven't managed to do that we found ways of working you know in the office whether it's on teams I mean, we've even now hired senior leaders based on teams, and it's not an ideal situation at all to, to take calls, to kind of take somebody in a leadership position without actually meeting them. So, and we're invent, reinventing ways to meet our customers. So it is, it is challenging. I wish travel comes back sooner than later. To me, travel is learning. Every day you travel, you learn. So that is the one part of the pandemic I wish was different, you know? Yes, yeah, but indeed, it, and for your business. I think, I think we are very lucky we live in a country where they actually are opening up, people are vaccinated, Expo is going to happen very soon. So 
I'm very optimistic that this will all change very soon and we'll be able to kind of treat life as usual, you know, so, and we'll appreciate it possibly more because we wouldn't have had these opportunities to do it, you know, but so, so I think, I think it's very much that, that we would, you know, use travel soon again, I hope. I think everybody shares that sentiment indeed. <laughs> and, you know, you were talking there earlier about how nobody can really, in terms of leadership, you know, do anything alone. But I'm also wondering in terms of business collaboration, you know, in terms of diverse business, and you have so many different strands, you know, within your business as well. What are the opportunities you think in terms of diverse business to collaborate more perhaps, you know, in, in other sectors to ensure success? I think in business, you collaborate every day. I mean, I consider our biggest collaboration as the supply base we have. There are suppliers we worked with for over 30 years, 20 years. To me, that is partnership, that is collaboration. There's, there's nothing you can do without that. So to me, it's not necessary across different you know, businesses, but it is how businesses at different levels actually support each other, build each other's business and develop together. So today we would be talking to suppliers saying that, you know, I'll give you an example saying if you have to, you know, kind of shorten lead times of production, this can only come with collaboration with suppliers who are willing to, to work and go that extra mile with you, you know. So it is, it is about collaboration. I think through the pandemic, there's been a lot of collaborative effort from governments to, to support different industries, to support retail as one of the industries to say, you know, how do we see it through? And I think, I think we recognize that that's becoming more and more important that new new ways of working new ways of industry are coming together so collaboration is very much a part of it you know if you if you look even at retail what what is a marketplace but collaboration you know so in in every way you kind of find different ways of leveraging each other's strength and that's, it's such a lovely note to actually to end this on. I mean, I like it, as you say, you know, that the retail sector is really, it's the marketplace. And if you're not collaborating, it's, it's, it's not all going to connect together and deliver, Completely. you know, what it has always done. That's so lovely. Thank you very um, much that. We have to wrap it up there really on behalf of ABLF. You know, it's been tremendous to have you here with us for this time. And I really want to thank you for your great no, insights thank you. and uh, and your great inspiration. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. All the very best. Thanks. Thank you. And to our audience at home, just a reminder there, I've been speaking to the chairwoman and the CEO of Landmark Group, Renuka Jagtiani. So once again, from all of us at ABLF, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.